Okay, let me talk about antimicrobials. Now, antimicrobials uh, means more than just antibiotics. We're going to talk about antivirals, uh, antiretrovirals, uh, antifungals, antiprotozoals. So, when we're looking at uh, microbes, uh, we're going just to beyond uh, just bacteria. Now, when choosing an antimicrobial, some of the things we have to consider is what is the pathogen. Uh, so we want to make sure we're choosing an antiprotozoal for the protozoa uh, and so on and so forth. I think you can probably figure that out. Um, is there a risk for allergy? Uh, does the patient have um, a history of allergies? Do they have other conditions that increase their um, risk for allergies, such as a history of asthma, a history of environmental allergies. Uh, have, how many times have they used the medication before? Um, there, there's always a risk for allergy, even if a patient has used the medication before, especially uh, when we're talking about antimicrobials. Um, so those are some things that you want to consider. Uh, is, the, is the pathogen sensitive to the antimicrobial of choice is something else to consider. Uh, it doesn't do any good uh, to give a patient a penicillin if the bacteria that is growing uh, is not sensitive to penicillin. Uh, we might as well just pour it down the drain. Uh, so those are again something to think about. Now, uh, Antimicrobials tend to be cytal, uh, meaning they kill, or they're static, which means they slow the growth of. Um, they can do that by uh, breaking down the cell wall, uh, they can inhibit protein synthesis, uh, they can keep this, the bacteria for, or the pathogen from taking in its food source or energy source, uh, and it can prevent it from making DNA. Um, some uh, bacteria especially, but uh, certainly any kind of pathogen could become uh, resistant. Um, so we, we get drug resistant uh, strains all the time. Um, Partly because uh, we, we destroy sensitive bacteria or pathogens, and then the remaining ones will mutate uh, and become insensitive to that drug. Uh, we've seen that happen with um, penicillins, and so uh, then it has to go back to the drawing board, and something has to be added or changed uh, to the penicillin in order to make it more effective again. <clears throat> it, it's not necessarily that the antibiotic creates a mutation. It's the fact that we use antibiotics when they're not needed and that people don't follow the directions, such as completing the full course of the antibiotic as directed. Uh, and so that allows um, you know, a few bacteria or whatever to, to hang out, and because they survive, then they are allowed to make changes to their structure. <coughs> One of the things as a nurse that you need to know <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, is that we typically are going to try to get um, specimens of the infected area, uh, whether it's blood specimen, urine specimen, sputum specimen, whatever, uh, to do uh, culture and sensitivity. So we need to be able to identify the pathogen that's growing, and we need to be able to, to identify what is that pathogen sensitive to. That needs to be done before we give a dose of any antimicrobial uh, in order to get um, an accurate 
uh, result. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the healthcare provider is going to wait uh, before giving that antibiotic or whatever. Um, it simply means that they may change their mind. So a person comes in with an upper respiratory infection, then you've got a certain unless you know, certain medications that are typically used for upper respiratory infections. And we're going to start with one of those. Then if you get a culture and it comes back and says, you know, this particular pathogen is not sensitive to that, well, then we're going to change to, to something that is sensitive to that. So, yeah, treatment will be started regardless. Antibiotics especially can be uh, broad spectrum, meaning they're, they're effective against a wide variety of bacteria, or they can be narrow spectrum, meaning that they're effective against just certain groups of bacteria or one type. So it could be that it's only effective against gram-negative rods um, or gram-positive cocci, um, not that I expect you to, to memorize uh, that detail about the antibiotics necessarily. Uh, just know that that uh, could be the case. Now, usually we try to use um, antibiotics, especially alone. Uh, they tend to have an antagonistic effect. It, this is one case where it, it isn't always more effective. We can't lower the dose of one in order to prevent side effects uh, like, say, we do with hypertensive therapy. So we need to use one unless um, in those rare instances when the infection is caused by several different micro microorganisms uh, or it's been proven that multi-drug therapy is more useful, such as in the case of tuberculosis or HIV infection. The other thing we want to be aware of that can occur with um, almost any antibiotic, uh, especially antibiotics and especially broad spectrum uh, antibiotics, is the idea of secondary uh, infections. When antibiotics are used over a long period of time or at high doses, it can destroy the normal flora. We see this a lot. <coughs> uh, people end up with a yeast infection or uh, pseudomembranous colitis, severe diarrhea, because the normal flora that keeps the yeast uh, in check or the uh, bad pathogens in the intestine in check um, are allowed to overgrow uh, those because we've destroyed those those that keep it in check. It's late in the day I'm getting kind of tired. Uh, so we want to assess patients for diarrhea. Now we all know that diarrhea is a common side effect of antibiotics. Uh, so we're not talking about um, just normal diarrhea. I, we're, we're talking excessive uh, water loss, diarrhea, uh, six, eight stools a day uh, that is going to be indicative of uh, another disease process. Uh, sore mouths, uh, white patches in the mouth indicative of thrush, uh, abnormal vaginal discharge uh, indicative of yeast infection. So, uh, painful urination might mean that they've got a yeast infection in the bladder and urethra. So those are things that we want to be uh, on the lookout for. The penicillins are probably the uh, one of the oldest uh, antimicrobials. <clears throat> it is considered a broad spectrum uh, antibiotic. So it treats uh, or uh, works on multiple types of um, bacteria. It's considered bactericidal. Uh, it breaks down the cell wall, so it immediately kills the pathogen. Um, 
they can be used for, again, multiple things, uh, streptococcal, pneumococcal, staphylococcal, uh, gonorrhea, and syphilis, prophylaxis, uh, or treatment. Um, biggest risk is allergy. Uh, lots of people are allergic to penicillins, and of course the, the biggest risk with allergy is anaphylactic shock. Uh, it can cause diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, and these are not symptoms of an allergic reaction, um, but could be just a normal uh, side effect. Um, interactions include oral contraceptives, um, penicillins, and, and really just about any antibiotic decreases the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. So we need to teach patients of childbearing age, female patients of childbearing age, uh, that they need to use an alternate form of contraceptive uh, while on an antibiotic. Diuretics uh, can, especially potassium sparing diuretics, can uh, increase the risk of um, hyperkalemia when used with penicillins. Uh, they should be taken on an empty stomach because food can increase the breakdown. And probenicide is a medication that sometimes is actually added with penicillin uh, because it decreases the excretion. So it's going to keep the penicillin in the system longer. And this uh, could be a harmful interaction and it could be a beneficial interaction depending on uh, what we need it. Uh, there is some risk of uh, liver and renal toxicity, um, so that should be observed for as well. <clears throat> Cephalosporins are similar in structure and function to penicillins. So what do you suppose that means? Well, anytime we have two things that are similar, if I'm allergic to one, there's going to be an increased chance that I'm allergic to the other one. And that is true in the case of penicillins and cephalosporins. A lot of people who are allergic to penicillins can take cephalosporins without any trouble, but not everybody can. So we want to use the cephalosporin cautiously uh, in patients that are allergic to uh, penicillins. They are classified according to generation. Um, First generation, obviously, are the older ones, clear up through fourth generation. Minor changes, I don't know, I say minor, um, small changes, maybe not even small, but to my, the way I think about it. Anyway, changes have, have been made to the chemical structure uh, at each generation so that uh, they are effective against bacteria that became resistant to earlier uh, generations. Um, so that's the main reason for the different generations. And I don't expect you to know uh, if this cephalosporin is a first or a, or a fourth uh, at, at this point in time, or even for the test. Um, so anyway, they are bactericidal means they're going to kill it as opposed to just slow it down. You'll notice, I think I've mentioned this before somewhere, that uh, most of your cephalosporins, uh, you know, we usually talk about the ending of a word of the generic name, giving you an indicator of its class. Well, in the case of cephalosporins, they all start with cepha. Uh, typically, uh, C, E, F, A, or O, um, but that gives you again a good indication that this is a cephalosporin. So cephataxim is a third generation. Again, it's broad spectrum, meaning it's going to cover a, a wide variety of pathogens and it's bacterial cytal. Um, it's useful for all types of gram-negative uh, pathogens. It may be okay for patients who um, can't tolerate penicillin, but again, they may have that cross-sensitivity or cross-allergy 
uh, to it as well. Um, it's not absorbed well from uh, the GI tract and secondary infections are common uh, including thrush uh, and candidiasis so we want to make sure um, that we're teaching the patients to use good hygiene uh, it can be transiently hepatotoxic and nephrotoxic um, it can affect uh, platelets um, so it may cause uh, bleeding, um, especially because of the irritation to the gut um, and the change in the GI flora. Probinicide, again, decreases uh, excretion of cephalosporin, similar, similar to uh, what they do for penicillin. Tell patients to avoid using alcohol. Uh, when taking a simple form because it can cause a disulfiram re reaction. And a disulfiram reaction is something similar to, um, it, it acts like an allergic reaction when in fact the patient may not be allergic uh, at all. <clears throat> Tetracyclines uh, <coughs> are again broad spectrum. Uh, they're typically used for uh, limited uh, things. They can be used for chlamydia, Lyme disease. Uh, they can be used in case of a penicillin allergy and we don't want to risk a cephalosporin. Frequently used for tetracyc for tetracycline for acne. <laughs> huh. Um, primarily in males, uh, because of the risk of teratogenicity, they typically aren't given to females of childbearing age. Uh, adverse effects are going to include um, super infections, diarrhea. Uh, the diarrhea may be severe enough to cause the, uh, discontinuation of the medication. Photosensitivity is a big one. Uh, people will get uh, an exaggerated sunburn in a very little time out in the sun with a tetracycline. Patients should be taught to avoid dairy products. Uh, they should avoid uh, mineral supplements um, or and iron-rich foods when taking tetracycline. And acids decrease the absorption, so it should be taken one hour before or two hours after um, a tetracycline. Macrolides are your mycins or erythromycins. They can be static or cytal depending on uh, the dose and the pathogen. Uh, they're frequently used for penicillin-resistant infections, um, so they, uh, or for a penicillin allergy. Adverse effects are primarily GI, uh, usually self-resolving. This is erythromycins or, or macrolides are a drug that we really want to pay attention to uh, severe diarrhea because this is one that can cause uh, pseudomembranous colitis. Um, and what happens is, just what the name implies, we have irritation of the intestines, uh, and there it, there's actually a pseudomembrane, a, a fake intestinal wall, if you will, um, and so everything the patient takes in just goes uh, right on through and they're not absorbing fluids, they're not absorbing uh, you know, vitamins, minerals, calories, uh, anything. So they should be taught to report more than five stools in a day and to not self-treat. 
they have excessive diarrhea, they do not want to be um, limiting that because the pseudomembranous colitis might be being caused by an overgrowth of Clostridium difficile. Interactions, there are numerous interactions, uh, cyclosporin, warfarin, theophylline. Um, Zithromax uh, or azithromycin is one that you guys are probably familiar with. Has a longer half life, so the treatment duration is short, and typically uh, fewer side effects. Um, most of your erythromycins can be given with food, so you would only need to learn which ones cannot be. Otherwise, it's, just, it's safe unless they are having lots of problems to so just give it one hour before or two hours after a meal. And your macrolides should not be given IM. Aminoglycosides, this is uh, genomycin. Uh, they again are bactericidal and broad spectrum. Um, used frequently for respiratory tract uh, infections. Uh, their biggest problem is that they are autotoxic and nephrotoxic. They have a relatively uh, narrow therapeutic effect and peak and trough levels will be monitored uh, for the use of, of genomycin. So we want to know what uh, symptoms to be looking for and what we should be watching, what should we you know, anticipate if we have autotoxicity. So you need to know that autotoxicity is uh, the inner ear, tinnitus, dizziness, gait disturbance, hearing loss. Um, so this is when we're going to really want to be doing that whisper test and notice that the patient has changed their volume when they talk. Uh, these are things that we can observe for. And then of course, uh, nephrotoxicity, observe um, urine output and characteristics of the urine. Fluoroquinolones, uh, ciprofloxacin, all of these end in floxacin. They're typically um, bactericidal. Um, adverse effects, they, let me back up and just, they can be used for gram negative and gram positive organisms. They're um, well absorbed PO. Uh, they can be taken with food. Um, your book, I don't think your book talks about it, but there's a lot of uh, controversy right now about the fluoroquinolones uh, related to um, a, a major adverse effect, um, which totally escapes me now. Uh, so this just goes to show that you always want to uh, be more up to date than, than your instructor, uh, paying attention to a new information that comes out uh, regarding uh, medications that you give. <clears throat> um, it can cause GI symptoms, uh, which is um, funny because it's used for GI infections. Dizziness, uh, liver failure, and again, phototoxicity, so that easy sunburn uh, can occur. Um, multivitamins and antacids are going to inhibit absorption, uh, similar to uh, the macrolides. Is it the macrolides or aminoglycosides? Yeah, the macrolides. Um, Caffeine can increase the nervousness and tachycardia. Uh, depending on uh, which one it is, um, t a lot of times they, they, they may not give it to children, um, depending on, on uh, cause there's, there's many, there's levofloxacin, gamofloxacin, moxifloxacin, ophlofloxacin, ciprofloxacin. Uh, so um, some things that will be specific to the type. 
that you might always want to uh, check out. So phonomides um, are uh, static. They inhibit folic acid. Uh, folic acid is needed for cell metabolism. Uh, they've kind of been overused, and so now their their use is limited to primarily the treatment of UTIs and uh, ear infections. Um, adverse effects, rash, um, which may or may not signify a allergic reaction. It can cause impaired renal function uh, because crystals can form which then get stuck in the renal tubules and uh, are going to cause damage. So make sure patients know to drink lots and lots and lots of water uh, when taking uh, sulfonamides. Again it can cause photosensitivity and we should avoid drinking alcohol with sulfonamides because that's where we get that disulfiram reaction, which can mimic an allergic reaction. So it's important to ask about alcohol use um, because they do get a rash, a sunburn-like rash, uh, achy joints um, with the disulfiram uh, reaction. So anytime they do get a rash, they do need to report it uh, and make sure whether it's okay to continue taking it or not. Vancomycin um, is kind of a miscellaneous uh, antibiotic. Uh, typically, we, we only give it IV, so it's, it's only given in um, a healthcare facility. Primarily, uh, its use is for uh, MRSA or only gram positive uh, bacteria. Adverse effects, uh, what we call red man syndrome, and this can be severe hypotension with or without a rash uh, accompanied by flushing, which gives us the um, red syndrome or the red color uh, and why they call it red man syndrome. Uh, it's interesting that typically uh, this flushing only occurs from the waist up. Vancomycin is also nephrotoxic and autotoxic, so we're going to be observing for those symptoms again. And, um, and usually only with high doses. Of course, we can always have an allergic reaction anytime, uh, so um, be observant for that. And secondary infections most likely are going to be candid, uh, candidious. It does have a lot of uh, interactions, and so that's something that you'll want to review uh, each time that you give it. Anti-tubercular drugs, isoniazide or INH is the drug of choice. Um, it's bacterial cytal for growing organisms and bacterial static for dormant. So um, if you're not sure what that means, you might want to go back and review um, tuberculosis uh, physiology. It can be used alone, um, but typically it's used in combination with rifampin, uh, especially for active disease. Adverse effects include uh, neurotoxicity. Uh, patients will complain of uh, numbness and tingling, uh, pins and needles sensation of the hands and the feet, uh, for which they can be taught to take pyridoxine. Everybody knows what that is, vitamin B6, uh, which can reduce the side effects of the reduce the paresthesias and help with the nausea and vomiting uh, as well. It is uh, hepatotoxic. Uh, make sure patients don't take it with antacids. It can cause a disulfiram reaction again, so they should avoid alcohol. They should also avoid alcohol because it is uh, hepatotoxic and it should not be taken with food unless instructed uh, to do so. Uh, 
uh, therapy, one of the, the, the main things that we have to support patients with um, for antituberculars is that it's a long-term therapy. Um, they need to take it uh, for a minimum typically of six months and maybe up to two years depending on the strain of bacteria that they have. Uh, some communities, patients have to come to a treatment center to obtain their medication uh, every day. Uh, so somebody can watch them take it and make sure that they do. <clears throat> Rifampin is another anti-tubercular uh, usually only used in conjunction with uh, INH. Should be taken one or two hours before or one hour before or two hours after. Uh, it does cause orange secretions. Um, so, and it may discolor contacts and clothing, you know, from sweat and, and um, the eyes. Uh, side effects usually will go away once the therapy is done. Um, nausea and vomiting uh, usually resolves over time. Uh, but if nausea and vomiting, especially with abdominal pain, uh, needs to be reported, in, especially if it's accompanied by jaundice, muscle pain, unusual bleeding, bruising, uh, which could indicate uh, liver damage. Uh, if taken with warfarin, there is a decrease in anticoagulant effect. Uh, INH uh, is going to increase the risk of hepatotoxicity. And women of childbearing age should know that it is an, an antibiotic essentially and it's going to decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. Now drugs for um, fungal infections, uh, typically we're going to uh, just use the newer drugs which are the azoles. Um, so we have fluconazole, isoconazole, ketoconazole. These are each discussed separately in your book, um, but they, they have very similar things. Um, they can be used both superficially or topically, or they can be given systemically for more severe mycosis. And mycosis is just a, another word for fungal infection. Uh, they can be taken with food or milk, uh, especially if they cause uh, GI distress, um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea is usually self-limiting. Um, they can cause the urine to become darker. And um, when taken with alcohol, uh, they get that disulfiram type interaction again. Uh, increased risk of bleeding with warfarin and increased toxicity with lithium and phenytoin. Topical antifungals usually, um, any of the azoles can be in a cream form. Uh, nystatin is primarily used for candidial infections. Um, typically, uh, if it's for oral, it's going to be a liquid. Uh, and it's given uh, as a swish and swallow. Um, so we wanted to make contact, that's why we wanted them to swish it around. So we wanted them to swish around in their mouth um, so that it makes contact with all the patches of uh, candidious uh, before they swallow it. And then um, by swallowing it, it will coat the esophagus and then have some effect in the intestine uh, as well. If taken as a tablet, it should be taken with um, a larger amount of uh, fluid um, to enhance absorption. So we need to just pay attention to, you know, is it a liquid form 
or is it a, a tablet uh, form? Uh, if for, it can be given, uh, it can be used topically as well and may cause a minor skin irritation. A patient teaching, it depends again on the, the form. Uh, if it's a cream, they should be sure and either you know, use a glove and wash their hands or at the very least wash their hands well before and after application. Um, if it is a liquid form, they need to not eat or drink anything for 30 minutes after they do their swish and swallow. Uh, antiretrovirals, these are uh, medications used for uh, HIV. Uh, Zidovidine uh, is, um, I guess, what we're talking about today. Uh, um, usually, Zidovidine isn't given until the CD4 count uh, is below 500. Um, it interrupts the synthesis of the DNA of the HIV virus. Side effects or adverse effects include anemia, uh, leukopenia, GI disturbance, fatigue, and weakness. Um, it does not reduce the risk of transmission, uh, and patients need to be made aware of that. Occasionally, there, there can be an, a life-threatening allergic reaction. Um, patients should avoid Tylenol and other antivirals because it can worsen bone marrow suppression. Aspirin can increase toxicity of uh, sidovidine. They should be taught to observe for symptoms of a superinfection. So again, the excessive diarrhea, uh, feeling, um, you know, sick, flu-like symptoms. Um, they should stop the medication if they develop a rash, shortness of breath, swelling of the face, wheezing. Um, if they develop symptoms of bone marrow suppression, like easy bruising, uh, hematuria, uh, excessively high fever, in the, especially in the absence of any other symptoms. Uh, antivirals, this is like a cyclovir, uh, inhibits viral DNA synthesis, typically used for herpes uh, simplex. Uh, it can be used prophylactically and it can be used for acute outbreaks. Um, it can be given topically or orally, so the, the, the route of administration is going to affect the uh, adverse <coughs> effects. Um, so topically it can cause um, just a, a rash or local irritation, I guess is what I want to say. Uh, Given orally, it can cause nephrotoxicity. Um, it can cause severe hypertension, and it can cause confusion. So we want to make sure that we've established baselines for all of those things. Um, it's going to interact with provenicide, which will cause it to stay in the system longer, and zidovidine, um, which uh, we've already discussed. Again, if doing topically, patients need to make sure that they wash their hands, wear gloves, um, remain abstinent during an outbreak, <coughs> uh, that they can still transmit the disease. Um, it doesn't cure the disease. It just reduces uh, outbreaks. Um, it can be given IV as well, and so we want to watch for phlebitis. And then lastly, antiprotozoals, um, metronidazole. Um, metronidazole is actually kind of an interesting um, 
drug because it's bactericidal, trichomonocidal, and protozoicidal. So it, it can um, use, be used for multiple uh, things. So obviously it can be used for trichomoni trichomoniasis, uh, it can be used for giardia, it can be used for malaria, um, and other protozoal um, types of infections. Uh, adverse effects include anorexia, nausea, diarrhea, dry mouth, metallic taste. Most of these do not cause a discontinuation of the med. Interactions would be with anticoagulants because of uh, increased risk of bleeding. Uh, alcohol, again, with this disulfiram reaction and elevation of lithium. Um, so we want to make sure that we get a good uh, history and teach patients that if it's being given for uh, sexually transmitted disease, such as trichomoniasis, that they should uh, have their partner treated as well to prevent re-inoculation. Okay. Um, that's it. Thanks.